Okay, good evening everyone and uh, welcome to this evening's uh, online church webinar. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us this evening. Um, uh, we'll, um, my name is Tom Geldard and I'm the Director of Communications uh, and Media for the Diocese of Chelmsford. And I'm going to start off the session this evening just talking a little bit about what we'll be going through uh, and introducing our panel. Um, the, um, I'm just going to share my screen um, so that uh, we can go through uh, what we'll be covering. Okay, so we'll start off uh, with um, uh, introductions of the panel um, and a prayer before we start. And then we're going to be um, having a sort of online discussion with our panelists this evening. And I'm delighted we're joined by um, three, uh, three members of clergy from very different contexts uh, across the diocese who are going to talk a little bit about their own experiences uh, of online church. Uh, the challenges uh, they uh, see in the future, as well as the opportunities and sharing ideas about uh, how they're going to meet those challenges and opportunities. So we'll start off with a discussion with those uh, panellists. We've got um, Caroline Beckett, who's the uh, vicar uh, of St. James Brightlingsea uh, in, uh, near Colchester. Uh, we've got um, the Reverend Alex Jiwan, who is team vicar uh, of Suffer and Walden and Villages uh, team ministry. Uh, and we've got the Reverend Alan Moss, uh, who's a pioneer minister um, in the Walthamstow area and uh, uh, assistant uh, priest. Um, so we're gonna have a conversation with them uh, to start off with, and then we'll put you in some breakout groups um, and um, uh, really to provide an opportunity for you to share your own reflections on what Caroline Alex and Alan have said, uh, and then also uh, to um, uh, share any ideas and stories you have, uh, and decide if you'd like to ask any of our panel uh, any questions. We'll then come back into a further panel discussion, and then we'll close um, with uh, prayer. Um, I'll introduce uh, our panelists in a moment, but before I do, um, I also want to introduce my uh, colleague, James Cottis, um, who uh, will be joining us this evening as well. James, uh, many of you may have met and know, um, runs the um, uh, uh, company that does the website for the diocese and many churches in our diocese. Um, and James will join the panel discussion at the end uh, and is an expert on things uh, technical and digital. So if you have anything, uh, uh, any technical questions, etc., James will be well placed um, to answer them. Before uh, we sort of meet the panel then uh, and have discussions with them, I'm gonna um, invite one of our panelists, um, Alan Moss, uh, to start us off this evening uh, with a prayer. Alan. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, Father God, I just thank you, Lord, that we can meet together tonight in this unique way, gathering from all over our diocese. And we just wanna, be able to share our thoughts and our heart this evening around being uh, incarnational in our different contexts. And I thank you, Lord, that wherever we're at, whatever kind of level of skill or whatever kind of things we're bringing tonight, Lord, we know that you are in our midst and that you are walking alongside us. So, Lord, we give this time of conversation to you and we pray, Lord, that this would be a good opportunity for fellowship, Lord, as we begin to discern what your kingdom looks like in this new context as we come out of the pandemic and, and look to new horizons. So we give you glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, right, well, let's, um, let's, let's introduce our panel for this evening then. Um, so um, uh, I think James is uh, going to pop people on screen. Excellent, there we go. Um, okay, uh, and um, we're gonna uh, we're gonna start off with uh, Caroline, um, who is a vicar of St James Brightlingsea. Um, Caroline, perhaps um, you could tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and St James Brightlingsea, and also um, uh, digital communications and online church, particularly I think since the start of um, the COVID pandemic in the, the last couple of years. Caroline, thank you. Good evening. Good to see you all. Um, so yes, I'm vicar in Brightlingsea. We actually have two churches. Um, 
We have All Saints on the Hill, which is our grade one listed, very large, um, much older church, and then St. James on the High Street. Um, so one PCC, two churches, which is the Holy Grail of the Church of England, as far as I'm concerned. Um, wonderful coastal community in Brightling Sea, but I'm also fairly active in various things in Colchester as well. Um, in addition to being um, the parish priest in Brightling Sea, I'm also on the vocations team and uh, I'm also part of uh, Citizens UK and um, was instrumental in founding the Colchester chapter of Citizens, which is something that I'm sure some of you on this will be familiar with, grassroots community organising. Um, so my use of, of technology um, has branched out into community organising as well as into work in the parish, and there's quite a lot of overlap between the two. I'm also a trustee of Colchester Food Bank um, and fairly heavily involved there. So those are, are the main strands, I suppose. And a big strand in life in Brightling Sea is the civic um, side of life. I'm chaplain to various local organisations and we have a, a very busy and vibrant and colourful civic and community life in Brightling Sea. In terms of the pandemic, we hit the ground running with a lot of digital stuff. I'd already been um, doing some online bits and pieces previously um, and already had an interest in that direction um, and had experimented with various things over the years. So it wasn't a massive leap. Um, and the congregation were very willing to try new things. They're an amazing group of people. We didn't have very much expertise at all. Um, we had a couple of people who knew their way around Zoom um, for work purposes, and that was really it. That was kind of the ceiling. Um, so we had to learn a lot quite rapidly. We operated our, our pastoral care and our connections on a series of circles. Um, so we had a postal circle for those with no um, online access at all. Um, we had a, a phone circle, we had an email circle, we had a Facebook circle, we had a Zoom circle, and then gradually, as we returned on site, we had a sort of circle that intersected all of those those other circles. And gradually, the running of each particular circle became um, influenced by different people. So different people rose up to take a lead and to participate. Um, and some people found their ministries very differently shaped. So, for example, our worship leader um, expressed his ministry by sending around the most marvellous links to the most incredible music every week um, so that we all had wonderful and uplifting things to listen to. Um, some of our older folk took a much more active lead in liturgy because they were able to um, without the difficulty of having to sort of get up from a seat and walk to the front and, and all of that pressure. So we had some ministries blossoming and we benefited from their wisdom and time um, while others of us were running ragged, trying to keep charities running and trying to um, organise volunteer schemes and what have you. And so it was interesting the fluidity with which people moved into different ministries and, and quite bravely tried some really quite new stuff. We did a lot of um, pre-recorded online content and we tried to do one big community um, event, if you like, um, online per month to give people something to mark time, um, to give some shape to the sort of endless formless isolation that people were in and to connect people to each other. So everything from um, a VE day street party where I went round and did hours upon hours upon hours of filming and then edited it into a community video so that everyone could see they weren't alone um, through to some quite contemplative and meditative stuff around Holy Week. Um, through to an online growing competition where people try to grow their own food in their gardens, um, through to doing blessing of the waters, which is our sort of nautical equivalent of beating the bounds um, and doing that in a sort of hybrid of uh, on-site and online. So there was lots of interpenetration, if you like, uh, between the digital and the on-site, um, the things that we could do with a small group of people and the people we could involve much wider. Um, and I'll I'll go into a little bit more of that later when when I talk in a bit more detail. But I think the main thing for us was just we we had the challenge of what did we simply film and stick online so that people could see certain things were still happening. But it's kind of a bit like watching a party that you're not invited to. Um, so it can be sometimes more alienating than helpful. What did we translate, tweak, adjust, change slightly? Um, so that it would fit 
the online space and what did we completely reinvent um, or create from scratch in the online space um, and so for example courses lent courses advent courses was something that we we looked at completely reshaping and our zoom service which still runs and runs every week um, is another example of something that has been shaped for the digital um, rather than simply being a reproduction of what we would do in the building Brilliant, thank you, uh, Caroline, uh, and a huge amount there, and a huge amount of different uh, of different things, and some of it brings it all back. Um, it sort of seems such a long time ago now that there was that sudden uh, change uh, and need to adjust and start for many people in starting to do this digital stuff for the uh, for the very first time. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the challenges of that and um, uh, and what that means uh, shortly. But but let's let's move on to Alex. Um, uh, who's uh, in Saffron, uh, Walden and Villages. Um, Alex, uh, tell us a little bit about your story. Certainly, thanks Tom. Yeah, well, uh, as, as you've heard, my name is Alex Jiwan. I'm a team vicar with the Saffron Walden team and I look after five villages there as well as a role in the wider team. And I've got three PCCs. Uh, not that we're uh, in any competition, Caroline, <laughs> but um, I've also uh, got role as an Area Ordinations Advisor and I'm looking forward to being a training incumbent this year, so exciting things ahead. And during the pandemic, we, like uh, many uh, churches, have been trying to offer some online content. Uh, we wanted to allow people to continue to worship God throughout the pandemic in these difficult times. And at the height of lockdown, uh, we were forced to find new ways of worshipping and adapt quite quickly to new ways of doing things. And I'm sure we've all benefited from some form of online worship throughout the last couple of years. But of course, it's not always easy to do. And rural churches particularly have found online worship a challenge. And the Cam Villages, which is my part of the Saffron Warden team, uh, have also struggled to do this. But we've done our best. We've managed to provide at least two online services per week uh, in two of our churches. So that's really good. We've used YouTube. Facebook and Zoom across the churches and even provided a monthly all age uh, worship service with craft activities too. That was quite a challenge, I can tell you. But through God's provision, we've managed to keep going. But we were faced with a challenge. Uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Tim Hardingham, an associate minister at Wendon Zambo, who sadly died in 2020, noticed that online worship using Zoom tended to be very much one-sided. It's a bit like what Caroline's just said about a party that you're not invited to. So we sought to make our services more interactive by making sure that people at home could join in and join in in the fullest sense. For us, the term hybrid means that people at home could be both seen and also actively take part in the service. This meant we could have readers, intercessors and even preachers working from their own homes but contributing to a service in a collaborative way. Someone would also introduce uh, interactive all-age activities for every service too and these activities could be downloaded from our website beforehand or during the service. The main thing we did that was a bit different is that we set up a screen in church so that everyone could see those who had joined us online and their voices were linked to the church's sound system so we could hear them as well. This meant that they were present, just as present as those who were in the church building. Everyone could see everyone else. To do this, we installed two cameras in the church. One faced the altar, so faced whoever was leading or reading, and the other faced the congregation so the people at home could see the wider church and their friends too. Now, there were some technical issues to iron out. Caroline's already talked about the, the technical challenges of doing uh, online worship. We needed a robust camera system, some good microphones and a stable internet connection. Now, those things aren't always easy to find, especially in a rural environment. Some of our churches, I suspect, will not have the capacity to have a stable broadband connection. But fortunately, we were able to do this with God's help. And we found some key people and equipment, and we found that key roles were also filled. 
Now, I can honestly say that we didn't spend a lot of money. So if you think finances is a big restriction, well, if a rural church like ours at Wendon Zambo can do it, then I predict, predict that everyone else could possibly do it as well with God's help. What happened was uh, we, uh, we managed to get some equipment from generous donations. So we didn't really buy anything new. We bought some new tripods, but the cameras were given to us, the screen we already had, and, uh, and we had the people with the necessary skills. So people have, have been blessed with the skills. One person is our treasurer, I should name him, uh, Robert Wilson. He handled the test technical aspects, keeping everything working. And we needed also a Zoom verger. Now, just in case you don't know, a Zoom verger is very important because it's somebody who allows people to enter the meeting, puts people in virtual rooms, and most importantly, mutes people if they forget to do it themselves, which was quite common, especially at first. And we also managed to include our choir as well. Because we couldn't sing in church, choir members would sing unaccompanied from home. And then they sing with their family members or on their own. And they would also sing the responses as well. So everyone had a part to play. And we found that our attendance did increase during the pandemic. And that was a good thing. And even people from the wider Saffron Warden team and from other places joined us. And I wonder whether that's linked to the fact that people can virtually pop into a service rather than make a long commitment. It might be a bit like the pre-pandemic rise in cathedral worship, where attendance can be anonymous, unlike a parish church who try and put you on a rotor as soon as you enter the building. Anyway, people who came to our hybrid service felt part of what was happening. They didn't just consume it, they participated in it. They gave as well as received. But it does take someone with the technical know-how to set up the equipment in the first place. And you may or may not have someone in your church to do that. But there are often people in our wider communities who can help. Some people really enjoy, you know, technical things. Myself, I'm a bit of a nerd, so I love all of that. Uh, you also might find some young people might want to get involved. It's a good way of getting those involved as well, because they're not so scared of technology. Now, technology, uh, like our hybrid service, doesn't always work. There are times when gremlins get in the system and things don't quite go to plan. And what you have to do there is just go with the flow and just, uh, just pray, really, and all things uh, come together in the end. We've had some tight moments, but it's been fine. And I also would suggest you need a rotor for all those different jobs, you know, the Zoom verger, the person in front charge of the cameras. It means that people aren't overburdened. And it's also useful to have electronic copies of the service so people at home can join in too. Now a challenge, we'll talk about challenges a little bit later, but one challenge we've noticed already is just having the energy and resources just to keep going because it's a lot of work. And we'll talk about the future in a minute in the post pandemic world, if that ever comes. But what we do need is just to work together. And it's been a really good example in Wendon of how we've worked together as the body of Christ. We've encouraged ourselves to be the church together, the church in an ever changing world. And I don't think I've ever seen the church embrace technology and change as much as it has in the last two years. It shows we can adapt and change and grow especially in difficult circumstances. So church shouldn't be done to people, but should remind, remind them that they are the church. And we're also the church here tonight. So whether you think a hybrid service might be good for your church or not, uh, there's always something we can offer our worshiping community. Who knows what God might do through your church? Thank you for listening. And I hope what I've said might spark some inspiration or some empathy. Alex, that's, uh, that's brilliant. Thank you ever so much. Uh, and as you say, we'll get on to challenges in a moment. But, but clearly one of the things you've identified early there uh, is that during the sort of the lockdown period, um, uh, doing church on Zoom really did allow people to feel part of it and, and for it to be very much a participative uh, experience. And lots of churches are now facing that challenge of when, once you're back in the building, if people do join from home, how, how do we make sure that it's not like they're watching it on the dodgy CCTV camera from the from the back of the building? Uh, and um, your story is kind of one of the, the sort of the best I've heard about ways of achieving that. So we'll definitely look forward to exploring that more again 
uh, shortly. Um, Alan, um, tell us about uh, your your uh, context and story in Walthamstow. Okie dokie. Evening all. Uh, my name is Reverend Alan Moss and I am a pioneer vicar type, whatever that means, down in uh, Walthamstow in E17, where the best boy band in the world uh, came out of, just in case you were wondering. And um, so I suppose my context is a little bit different in that, you know, I'm ordained and I'm a priest, etc. but I don't actually have a parish per se. I'm actually an associate minister at St Mary's in Walthamstow. That's how I'm, I'm licensed. Um, but my job is to work exclusively on the local estate. So outside of the church buildings, um, sort of, you know, that we've got some really big estates in the area and just sort of connecting with people where they're at. Um, but... I suppose to put some context of what I've been doing over the pandemic. So in 2020, when it feels like a, a thousand years ago, but when all this sort of started to uh, kick off, I was actually just in my final part of my curacy. So I was still in my curacy phase and I was based in Romford. Um, for those of you that know it on that kind of Essex, East London border. And um, we had two churches. One was based right in the centre of an estate, the estate where I grew up, in fact. And then one was a very rural, picturesque, thousand-year-old church um, in a little village called Haverinati Bower, where everyone who's anyone wanted to get married, etc. So uh, people might might know of those churches. Um, so when the pandemic hit, so I'd been looking at sort of digital theology and these sort of things for a couple of years by then. And to be honest, it was very wasn't it was very rarely spoken about. You know, it was that kind of you know thing that. You know, people like Alex, Caroline and myself and a few others might be having a few behind closed doors conversations about. And then all of a sudden, you know, it all sort of become very relevant. And uh, my training incumbent at the time, a guy called David, he, um, he'd been a, a vicar for about 20 years, but mainly in very rural context. And, you know, being a man in his, in his 60s as well was very sort of not anti-technology, but certainly didn't know where to start. He got his first... Uh, smartphone ever in like 2018 or something so uh, we were kind of trying to work out what we do in that context you know we have you know congregations and mixed you've got some really loads of kids and then a few teenagers people 20s and 30s then a massive jump to people in their 80s and 90s and we were trying to work out how we deal with it it's one church we had a kind of a wi-fi connection and in the other church the more picturesque one up the top we had a Wi-Fi connection in the hall, the little purpose-built hall next to it, but nothing that could quite penetrate these thick old walls of the church. So we couldn't quite stream from the church. So, um, and I kid you not, the first thing we did was try and uh, connect the Wi-Fi into the main church building. So we got a massive, and I do mean massive, Ethernet cable, which plugs into the router, and we run that across to the church, and then we took a coat hanger and we took a coat rack and we bought this really weird kind of little satellite dish thing and we hooked it up at the back of the church <laughs> and we covered it with a bit of rubber across the graveyard, try not to disrespect anyone's family member, albeit most of them died about 500 years ago, but still, you never know. Um, and uh, yeah, and it just kind of felt like, you know, we'd have the sound man at the back trying to, trying to hold you know, like back in the day when you're trying to hold a CB aerial up in the air, trying to catch, trying to catch the Wi-Fi, you know, as if with a net. So uh, it was all a little bit weird, but we managed to sort of wangle our way around it. And um, essentially, we just did the, the real basics. You know, I had a Facebook, uh, set up a Facebook page for the church. Uh, we decided to live stream just me and my training incumbent in the, in the church up in the village um and it was very much a you know a bit of a well it was a massive learning curve really we were trying to connect with our congregation many of whom didn't know how to use facebook or our facebook pages etc so helping people set up facebook pages or find links and you know all sort of still new to zoom etc so it was a real learning curve like for like for many um, and then just really, it was the process of practice, you know, trying to work out how we, you know, get better. And over the period of uh, 2020 um, and then into 2021, we, you know, we just tried different things. We 
Um, got the Wi-Fi upgraded a little bit again, so the Sandman could actually sit down through the service. We um, decided we got a camera, we got a streaming camera, um, which through a friend in the diocese, we got a bit of a discount. And, um, you know, so we were all playing around with that. And I sat in the church for about three days trying to work out how to turn it on, but we got there. Um, so we, it was kind of this real uh, explore, exploratory phase where we were just trying to work out the basics because often people try and jump in there and, uh, you know, try and do all the really complicated stuff. Like, oh, we've got to build complicated websites and learn to code. And I'm like, what? You must be joking. I can barely speak English, let alone write code. Um, it's the Cockney boy in me. I'm, I'm struggling, you know? So anyway, so we were trying to, uh, we were trying to sort of put all these pieces together. And yeah, and over time, we, we just sort of started to, we didn't exactly master it, but we started to get a little bit more savvy with it. I know someone asked a question in the chat about how you deal with people who can't or don't want to be on camera. So we started to work out little zones where people could sit. So if they didn't want to be on camera, they could be, they could be in that place. And we, we started to see that actually there were people in the estates who had never come to the church for many different reasons because of, you know, sort of, you know, whether it's just because they'd heard things or they, you know, they had bad experiences with churches. And all of a sudden, we just found people in the local area connecting in. Um, people with disabilities who couldn't physically get to church were saying, well, this is amazing. I've never been able to get to church or I haven't for years. And so we, we started to realise we were reaching a whole load of people um, that we didn't even think about before we started to do it. And then fast forward uh, to uh, sort of February, well, I guess more May time last year. And I started, I finished my curacy and moved to Walthamstow. And obviously, because my job is to work outside the context of the church building, to work in the estates, etc. Obviously, I haven't got a church in, you know, I don't do general church services. I help out in other churches and I sort of do Eucharist and preaching at St Mary's but in general I'm on the estate and so we've started to try and utilize digital in different ways you know even even things like you know people who can't afford laptops sometimes it's it's trying to put technology in people's out in people's hands and school children who can't access online teaching and you know helping them get laptops and things like that so um, and so we're, we're kind of exploring what it looks like now, building community on WhatsApp, building communities on not just Facebook, but, you know, Zoom meetings, looking at and someone else mentioned TikTok there. There's even a little growing community on TikTok, surprisingly enough. Um, so, yeah, so so that's kind of what we've been doing. So it's been a real learning curve for everyone. Um, and like I say, and we're still trying to work out what that looks like in a, a state context. But I guess we'll move on to that in a, in a little while. Thank you, Alan. And I think something that's come across already from, from all three of you really is um, uh, is the importance of uh, not not wanting to be perfect from the start, that having to improvise and, and, and just get on with it really, rather than feeling that you've got to have all the perfect equipment and the perfect setup uh, before you start doing it and not being afraid to uh, not being afraid to do things a little bit badly sometimes until you, you can, get, can get it going. Um, before we go into breakout group, perhaps I could ask each of you just to sort of briefly say um, where you think you are now, and particularly as we're, we're, we're well, we've always been in a period of change, uh, and never more so than over the last couple of years as the restrictions come and go and the situation changes all the time. But assuming we're in a position now where, where, where we hope that the number of people coming to in church worship is. is, is will start to grow again what are the challenges in, and opportunities in terms of how we continue to embrace digital and the online and what what role does it have Alex do you want to kick us off on this one certainly will yes um, I mean we still still stream our services every week uh, now that we've returned to the church building but we've begun to only do our hybrid services just at important events um, or during particular seasons or you know for, for special so we might do the jubilee service for example we might do that actually uh, as a hybrid service but generally we're just streaming um, I'm hoping we are going to be able to offer something creatively as we look forward and I'm excited about that because our hybrid service has enabled us to think about different ways of doing things about the possibilities for online and digital worship 
And it's something I think the church as a whole will continue to need to do, at least for the time being. Uh, and if, as we've heard, COVID might be something we need to learn to live with, then I hope that digital worship is something we need to learn to work with as well in the coming future. Uh, online church will, I think, have an important role uh, in our lives as it allows people to remain connected wherever they are. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily going to replace face-to-face -face worship, but it can enable those with anxiety, uh, mobility issues, or those who travel to remain uh, connected to their church. And there are some challenges for the church and some serious um, challenges for us as a rural church. We've got a number of people who've developed some really good skills. Uh, and to be honest, I'm not technically uh, minded at all. Um, James can answer any technical questions today because I couldn't do it. But um, the people in, in, in Wendon have really embraced the technology. But of course, they need to be able to share that knowledge. It's no good if one person just keeps it to themselves. So we're going to have to create, I feel, a uh, sort of uh, a digital working group. So we've got a, a, work, a, work thing, a group that encourages one another, talks to one another, um, supports one another and shares the workload. Uh, we also need to make sure that we've got some money in reserve for digital work now. So it's going to have to come into our budget. We're going to have to think about our Zoom subscriptions, whether we need to pay for uh, um, upgrading of equipment and making sure we've got the best internet connection we can possibly have. So each of our PCCs will probably need to rethink how it spends its money. I suppose one of the, the biggest uh, questions we've had since coming out of the, the, of, of the sort of lockdown, at least, we can't really say we've come out of the pandemic, can we? But things are getting easier. The question for us is when or if should you ever stop your online provision? And, and what does it, when does it seem like a good idea? Is it when just one or two people are joining us online or actually should we make sure we're inclusive and include those one or two as well? Now my own feelings is that we should carry on and uh, make sure that even if it's just one or two people joining us online then we keep doing it but of course it's not my decision on my own and uh, some of the team might say well actually um, we're doing a lot of the work here Alex you know come on one or two people is that enough? Well I haven't got an easy answer but I would like to try while it's needed to keep going with it. And um, as I said earlier, inclusive church means including everyone. And I think online and digital church therefore has a viable future. Jesus said where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst of them. And I think this works both in the physical and the virtual world. So in this way, we can continue to be the body of Christ wherever we are. And if God's in it, then all will be well. But thanks. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, Alex. Um, Ka Caroline, your, your thoughts on challenges and opportunities? Um, I think that the first thing to say is that there is a real balance of love and fear involved um, mm. in our response. And we need to be careful that we listen more to the love than to the fear. Um, there are a lot of fears, safeguarding, um, worries about, you know, people being filmed, worries about doing something that gets broadcast across the nation inadvertently. You know, there, there is a lot of fear. Fear comes from the unknown, and so we can educate ourselves about the technology. Um, but also, fear is an essential component in discipleship. Um, and I think the avoidance of fear is unhelpful in a church congregation, actually. We need to push into that just a little bit. Um, we need to explore this space regardless of whether we do it in fear and trembling. We're not going to get it perfect. And actually, Jesus sent his disciples without a bag or extra shoes or extra food. He sent them in deliberately vulnerable and in need so that the first approach that they would make to any community was to need help. And there are great missional opportunities in being useless at tech and saying, we really want to reach you as a community. We want to, you know, we're committed to you, but we don't know what we're doing. Look at us. This is our online offering. Come and have a laugh at us and then come and help us do it better. Um, there, you know, that is missional. It's okay to mission by not being good at things. We don't always have to mission doing things onto people from a position of strength. Um, the community is more than willing to, to work with us and alongside us, or at least that's been my experience. Um, so I think we need to be careful that we don't give in to fear. Um, I think that it's easy to feed the machine that already exists, to do the things we've always done that has 
are you know polished and familiar and what have you it is harder to feed the scrawny ugly baby of a new idea or a new concept when we don't know what it's going to be it is a lot harder to lead when you don't exactly know where you're going um, but I think that is what we're being called to do. And I think maybe it's easier perhaps for people who have a pioneer bent of mind already like Alan, but actually we are all as Christians called to be pioneers. Pioneer ministry isn't this separate thing you can put in a box and leave to people like Alan. It's something that we're all called to be as leaders. And I don't just mean people wearing dog collars. Um, we are all called to follow Jesus. And that means following him over the hill into the distance you know, <laughs> with the dust of his feet on our forehead, as it were, and, and going, going onward. Um, I think that we have to beware of mind traps, of uh, false pairs of opposites. It's not real versus virtual because online stuff is very real and online communities offer real support. Um, we can't say embodied and disembodied forms of worship because I'm embodied here right now. My fingers are pressing the keys. Um, my eyes are looking at the screen. Um, we can't say in person and online because I'm in person right now. I'm not a different person. And in fact, you can see my face better than if we were all sat in rows facing the front. So what does it mean to be in person online? And I think we have to be careful because these pairs of opposites can be very divisive and it can lead us into the trap of thinking that we have to be either or. And actually there is this huge spectrum of digital involvement you don't have to jump from no digital involvement to doing 20 whizzy things before breakfast and having an online international you know, speaking ministry. Um, you can take a few tentative steps. You can signpost good stuff other people have done. It doesn't all have to be you. Um, one of the things that I'm learning, I'm, so I'm actually doing a master's in digital theology. And one of the things I'm learning is that we as Christians spend an immense amount of time thinking about the how how do we do this and not make fools of ourselves, which is an understandably human preoccupation, but we need to spend a little bit more time on the why. Why are we doing it? And what is it in the nature of God and the nature of us that means this is necessary for us to do this? Because the digital already interpenetrates our lives. There is no line between doing stuff digitally and doing stuff physically in person, whatever label you want to put on that, because we have our phones on us, get, you know, take a certain generation and the phone is never far away. Um, you know, we're using technology all the time. I mean, Tom, you're sat there looking at me through glasses. That's a use of technology mediating your experience of the world. Um, we've been using technology for a long time, and this is just a natural extension of the things that we already do as human beings. And so it's not as if we are standing on the edge of some massive cliff about to hurl ourselves off it. We've already left that cliff behind and we actually need to accept that we're already inhabiting this world. And the question is, how do we inhabit this world distinctively as Christians? And I think that there are huge benefits to online. People with social anxiety get to see behind that big, thick, heavy door and may be more likely to come on site if they visited us first online, for example. It's very scary to go to a, a new place. People with disabilities, and that's me right now, I'm actually not working. Um, I can't walk more than three streets without feeling the need to sit down. Um, my breathing's not right. I'm recovering from COVID. I got COVID on, on Christmas Eve. Um, so I'm actually working while not working because I can sit here and be on a screen with you guys and do something meaningful and worthwhile, even though I'm in my bed and can't leave it at the moment. So in a very real sense, it unlocks ministries um, and it enables people who are actually in some, in some ways quite broken and in other ways, incredibly wise, the opportunity to exercise ministry and the church, the chance to benefit from that in a very real, very embodied sense. Um, so I think I, I want to say, let's not be frightened of the digital. And there is something very biblical about creating something, saying the sort of equivalent of let there be light, putting something out there that then goes on and ministers without us and keeps going year on year on year. I sent a poem out into the ether about four years ago. Somebody contacted me a month and a half ago to say how transformative they had found reading it. I'd forgotten I'd even written the thing, but it was out there ministering without me. And, and I think that mirrors in many ways the co-creation that we're called to when, when God says, let there be light and encourages us to be bringers of light. Um, so I want to encourage us into a narrative of love and openness, wary, careful, 
discerning, but love and openness rather than just the fears and the difficulties. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, really interesting what you say there about fear and fear and love. And it uh, it may have been Alan who, uh, in one of our earlier webinars, I think perhaps talked about different different technology and media through time and how whenever there's a new type of media, um, uh, there's fear about it and there's resistance to it. And then that suddenly becomes incorporated into the normal uh, and, um, uh, and people sort of accept it as a way of, uh, of, 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 of practicing their faith and, and then the next thing comes along and there's, there's similar sort of fear again um, and that this may just be the next, the next phase in that. Um, Alan, your, your reflections. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll try and keep it as brief as, uh, as I can. Uh, I'm a chatter, but I'll, um, I guess uh, you're talking about some of the, the challenges, and I think I want to echo uh, a lot of what both Alex and Carolina said, in that, um, you know, this idea that somehow technology or, you know, or the, the different sort of ways we've been utilising technology over the last sort of couple of years is somehow brand new. It, as Tom said there, we did, yeah, it was one of the first webinars we did where I was reflecting on what um, what they call the uh, digital revolution timeline. And it actually starts way back in the 1930s. Um, I think it was the 30s, uh, somewhere around when the transistor was developed. And then, you know, we go through TVs and radios and PCs, et cetera. And so, you know, it's actually been a journey that we as a world have been on for a long, long time. And uh, more than a lot more than half the planet is online now, etc. We're in a completely different world. So, you know, it, it's it, it's not one or the other, as Caroline was saying. And I think for me, one of the challenges is how we have these deeper conversations. I think I saw someone um, mention about, you know, there are any other forums in the diocese to discuss these things. Well, we've got a, a Facebook page and obviously we're going to be doing more of these because we want to provoke discussion and we want to keep the narrative along this stuff going um and i think also for me it's about getting into the more nuanced stuff as again as, as caroline was saying we exist you know holistically uh, you know i exist physically here you see me physically there you know what's the difference between me you seeing me through your lens or you seeing me in person i mean i might even be a little bit more handsome online to be honest there's all sorts of filters you see me in real life it's terrifying um I often say people think I've mugged the vicar. I'm covered in tattoos. I think I've just nicked his shirt. But the but the reality is, is that actually online I can get a you know a different side of me across, perhaps. Um, and and there's a really interesting thing I read recently. Um, it was by a lady. She's a I don't think I don't know whether she's Christian or not. But she was talking about the difference between broadcasting and live streaming. Um, and she, you know, so often, you know, as churches or as people, we can broadcast our lives or we like, or like we broadcast our services and, um, you know, where we just kind of put things out there, you know, for consumption, for people to view and see. And it's not often very interactive, but actually there's a whole narrative now around live streaming. People live their lives in in both physical and digital forms all at the same time you know we carry our phones we talk to our friends in person whilst texting someone else in australia whilst being present on facebook whilst having a, a discussion on instagram or whatever you know so there's all different ways in which we interact and live streaming is a way that we live our lives in a very open and real way both online and in person and the people you know for for especially younger generations, those boys since the sort of mid nineties, this is very much a way of life. This is not a brand new thing. And so I guess for me, one of the challenges is how we as a church, um, you know, look at some of these deeper theological things, like I put again, someone put about, you know, the, the physicality, et cetera, of, of the Eucharist. And for me, that represents, you know, what we think about the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit blessings only if it's right in front of us or could it bless the bread and wine 
if I pray a prayer right now, could I pray a blessing and the Holy Spirit be where you are and where I am at the same time and bless the elements? You know, is that possible? These are the things, these are the challenges that we're facing and we can only do that in narratives. That's one of the reasons why we want to do these webinars and build these forums so that we can have these conversations. And I'm not saying one is going to be right and one is going to be wrong and we'll all come down on different sides of these things. Um, but I think the opportunities that technology give to people um that have never you know had don't have the same opportunities that we do physically and i'm thinking in particular people with disabilities or, or all kinds of other issues which mean they can't interact in a social way that we potentially can um i think it's a, it's a really exciting time to be to be ministering in this culture personally so brilliant thank you alan um we are we're we're running slightly over here. It's, uh, the the conversation has been fantastic, as has the chat. There is uh, there's some really good stuff in the chat, and I think so that we can um, finish when we said we will. Uh, we'll we'll skip the breakout groups um, and use the fantastic things that have come up in the chat to, to further this conversation. Uh, but please do keep keep putting that stuff in the chat, uh, and we'll try and stay on top of it. Um, so one of the things, I'll try and pick out some themes from the chat here. Um, one of the things that a couple of people have talked about is, is accessibility here uh, uh, and, and about where are we with online church in where there are people in our, uh, in our communities who, who don't have digital access or, or can't use digital. Um, and you must have all come across that in your own context and you, you've mentioned it briefly already. And uh, it may be in some cases that digital isn't the answer for those people, but how do we make sure we stay an inclusive church uh, whilst getting the best out of digital? Um, uh, and how do we meet that challenge? Um, who'd like to uh, who'd like to pick us up on that one? Um, Alex, do you want to do you want to go first on that one? Yeah, it's, it's a really good point, Tom, actually. You know, how do we uh, engage with those people that are finding um, digital and online worship difficult to access? I mean, we've talked about inclusivity quite a lot this evening, and it's not by nature that inclusive for, you know, an 80 year old who's never used, say, Zoom before to be able to get onto a service and access it. I mean, the way we've done it in, in, in the villages I look after and indeed in the town in Saffron Walden is to kind of create a kind of network of help so what we've tried to do is we, we've tried to get in contact when, when it was complete lockdown we tried to get contact relatives to to say could you talk your 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 family member through it or could you pop round if it was allowed and, and talk through what needs to be done that was one way we've done it the other way we, we've done it is we've actually physically written down some help sheets and how to get on and what, what you should see and what you click on and what you don't click on so we've, we've done it that way try to do some sort of uh some gentle guides for people to see them through but it is a challenge and it's one we do need to recognize i have to be honest there are people that have avoided uh online worship completely they just couldn't get it they didn't enjoy it they didn't find it worked for them so as the body of christ we're all different all uniquely made and i think we have to accept that some people it just doesn't work for them so mm. Brilliant, thank you. We've got some good, uh, good um, sort of comments on that in the chat as well. Um, Anne saying we still have several members who phone in every week. Uh, we deliver them a service sheet and song words, uh, and uh, Ian and Jane have said they do that as well. And they use the phone in functionality on Zoom, of course, which allows people um, just to, to use uh, to use telephones. Um, there's also stuff in there about um, uh, about uh, sort of skill skill sets within within our congregations um, and the challenge of, of not necessarily having a team of people who are going to be able to um, do all this stuff. Caroline, do you want to have you have you had experience of that? Do you want to sort of share any thoughts around that? Um, so not really experience per se. Um we've got experience in being inexperienced. Um, there are there are a few members of our congregation who can use various aspects of technology, but largely it's shared ignorance round. Um, and we're a fairly small coastal parish. Um, but what we found is that where we couldn't do something, we could use something that somebody else had already done that was good. Um, Citizens Colchester 
worked with the university and paired up the university with some older Methodists who were trying to get online and they produced some really helpful how to really basic guides to how you know how to use Zoom and how to use Facebook and how to use it. So so that's been very helpful. So we didn't create that resource as a church, but we use it. Um, there are part of it is just being able to signpost people to where they can get what they specifically need. And making those as much part of discipleship conversations as stewardship or worship or prayer or Bible reading. Um, I think as well, we need to open up a conversation around those who are digitally disenfranchised, those who are priced out of the market, those who really struggle. We are encouraged to share our food. If we have two coats, we give to one who has none. What if we have unlimited Wi-Fi and our neighbor can't get online? Um, you know, there are negotiated relationships of trust around that, but is there a challenge for our churches that we have one set of internal Wi-Fi that runs everything in church and a second account that people can log on to simply by standing outside the walls and logging on if they desperately need to, you know, complete a benefit application or, or do whatever? Would that make us a natural hub then for people to gather and draw to us the kinds of people who perhaps most need our help in the same way that offering food does? Or offering other things um, and then where do you go from there so I think digital hospitality is a new challenge um, and is a social justice issue which the church needs to explore now we're not doing that in my church my congregation are not there yet um, we're on a journey um, but it is something that I care very deeply about and if anyone's interested in having a conversation I'd love to have a conversation I have no answers just a lot of quite good questions I think that leads us on really nicely, Carolina. I'm going to come to Ellen next. I mean, one of the things, one of the things um, uh, that's been mentioned already is the Chelmsford Diocese Facebook group, which uh, which Alan actually uh, set up for us. We are really, uh, we're really keen to get that going because I think none of us have the answers on this, and we don't know where we're going. But I'm certain that by, um, but by being in touch with each other and sharing ideas potentially even sharing resources and I can see quite a few people are sort of talking about that and you alluded to it as well Caroline uh, in the uh, in, in your answer there um, but by by being in touch with each other we can make uh, you know we can we can make sure we we harness this technology for good. Alan do you want to say a little bit about the Facebook group and really where we hope it will hope it will go? Yeah yeah well so I mean I guess quite early on you know my involvement with the uh with tom and the team at the diocese really came through uh archdeacon chris burke some of you may know in the uh i think it's the barking area and it that's right I get yeah that's right yeah. don't tell yeah. don't tell the archdeacon i forgot where he works but either way uh, yeah and, and so you know because we were like you know there you know all this sort of you know stuff is happening we're all going through it but i think you know we everyone felt like perhaps we we're going through it in silos and all the you know I, I don't know about you but our church felt like every other church in the area was getting it right and we were the ones getting it wrong and then lo and behold six months down the line we found that actually we were a little bit further ahead than the churches we thought were more tech savvy so we wanted to put the facebook group together so that on a diocesan level people could have discussions um you know yeah around practicalities and support and stuff like that but also because we were aware that quite early on um there were you know the conversations around well what does what does this mean for church you know there was i think caroline mentioned earlier on you know there's a lot of fear um immediately sort of just bubbled up in people of uh Oh, you know what what does all this mean um you know are we ever going to go back to church you know are they trying to shut down our churches and move us all online some of the things that you know that like we already discussed about the eucharist or you know the the physical you know very physical parts that, that we have to our to our churchmanships etc and so we thought a facebook page could be just one platform um, of hopefully we can develop others as well where we can have these conversations where people can you know like at the moment we're sharing certain things so the church central church of england as well as premier digital our friend pete phillips are doing loads of thinking around this on a national and international level and so there's loads of resources out there and so we're sharing stuff on the facebook page but we also want it to be a place for narrative it's about interaction when we stream a service on sunday i'm always making sure i'm talking to the people 
on Facebook. You know, I'm always making sure that they're interacting and I've got a little phone up with me. Even when I'm doing communion, I have the phone on the altar with me and I carry those people with me um, to make sure that we're, we're interacting in a very real way. Um, and so that's what the Facebook page is all about for us to ask questions, have discussions, um, you know, hash some stuff out, um, as well as, you know, seek support from one another. So you don't feel so isolated where you are that, you know, you're the only church having to hang a, a Wi-Fi expander on a coat hanger, you know, that kind of thing. So, so that's what, so that's what the Facebook group's all about. It's about support. Um, and, and again, it's about being a community. It's not like a separate thing that just is out there. It's, it's actually a way for us to be the body of Christ together as well online and build one another up. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you very much, Alan. And uh, I, so I'm, I'm really determined that we, uh, we try and make this work um, and, and just, Please, please do use it in a way that you will find useful for yourself and um, that you think others will find useful. I just, I see Caroline just put, shall we put a, a, an archive of how-to guides in there? Yes, please, definitely. Um, what, we don't, what we don't want it to be is kind of like a customer help desk where, um, where lots of people ask a small number of people for advice, but where actually everyone is just in there and sharing their thoughts and ideas, things they've seen. I've, I've seen the people are talking about other online networks where there's ideas. Yeah, tell tell people in Chelmsford Diocese about them in the Facebook group so they can be part of those as well. Um, Tom, yes, could we put a little space on the diocesan website for these things for those who don't do Facebook? Yeah, definitely. There is one. There is one. Um, so, um, uh, in fact, James, you are right to dump that in there now. So we've got an online church. Um, uh, 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 pages on the um, diocesan website which has got lots of links off to uh, various uh, resources and that sort of thing is is that somewhere we can upload to though or do we need to send it to you first uh, no you're so people need to send that stuff to us first um so, yeah because so, so, i couldn't uh, upload directly to there which is why i'm asking yeah, yeah so well let's have a look at that let's see if there are other places we can put resources um but but please do you know please do put stuff in facebook for now as well while it's there and link off to stuff um, and hopefully we can get that conversation going. Um, we have uh, we've reached uh, nearly eight o'clock incredibly uh, incredibly quickly and there's it feels like we could go on for many more hours um, and that's what I'm getting I'm starting to sound uh, ridiculous with the plugin of the Facebook group now but that's that's what it's there for Car carry on the conversation there. Um, I want to give a special thanks to our panel this evening, um, to Alan, Caroline and Alex. That's been absolutely um, fascinating. And as, as I say, it's felt like a conversation starter um, uh, and we could go on for many more hours. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for James as well um, for keeping the show on the road. Um, and uh, thank you to everyone for joining and for your contributions and questions as well. Um, it's been a really uh, enjoyable conversation. We, we have recorded this as well, so we'll also um, we'll also put that on our website and um, uh, on the on our social media, um, so others can watch it. So do give it a plug um, if uh, if you know anyone who you think might find it useful. We plan to do more of these um, going forward as well, um, and stay in touch with us and let us know if there's anything in particular uh, you'd like us to cover. Um, but before we finish, I'm going to ask Alan um, uh, to, uh, to lead us in prayer. Alan. Okie dokie. Father God, I thank you for the conversations that we've been having tonight. Lord, I thank you for Alex. I thank you for Caroline, Lord, for everything that they're doing to expand your kingdom, Lord, in, in brand new ways, Lord. I thank you, as Caroline said, Lord, it, it's not about the, the tag of pioneer, Lord. We are all pioneers. We're all uh, stepping into new ground every day, seeking new relationships, building your kingdom. And Lord, I just pray as we go away this evening to think about some of the things that have been discussed and, Lord, the questions that we may have asked and that we're mulling over and the things that we're, we're chewing on. I just pray, Lord, that you would rest with us that you would guide us that you would lead us in in the different directions that you you want us to go lord it's all for your kingdom lord. we love you and that's why we do what we do so help us lord when we're reading our scripture when we're praying and and when we're out and about just doing our daily shopping or whatever it is lord help us to always be attentive to your spirit in these situations 
I pray for a restful night, Lord. I pray, Lord, for peace to wash over us. And I pray, Lord, for this uh, good, great conversation to continue, Lord, as we seek your kingdom in our different contexts. So thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, and have a lovely evening.